Thank you for that very kind introduction, introduction, Pastor Castillo, and thank you, Grace Hill Church. I have um, met some of you, and I have not met all of you, um, but you are very kind people, and it has been a joy to get to know some of you. This morning, well, the ones that I have met, okay? <laughs> Bo, Bo is, he, yeah, you, I was thinking of you, actually, when I said that, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, this morning I wanna to propose to you a proposition that maybe is not something you have ever considered before, and that is this. You are a theologian. Now when we say, when we talk about theology, that is, that is sometimes an intimidating thing. Sometimes you hear, you hear the word theology and people immediately recoil, maybe you recoil but it's true. You are a theologian because you have thoughts about God. Every person is a theologian because every person has thoughts about God. The question is not whether or not you are a theologian, you are. The question is, are you a good theologian? When you think about God, what comes to your mind? For some of you, words like love, goodness, joy might come into your mind. For others, words like holiness, reverence, fear, obedience may come to your mind. The Bible teaches both things, both sides of the coin. In C.S. Lewis's well-known children's epic, The Chronicles of Narnia, God is represented, represented as Aslan, this great intimidating lion. In the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you have these characters, you have the Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, and they're conversing with the children. And in this conversation, they're describing Aslan, again, who is the, who is the Christ figure in The Chronicles of Narnia. And the beaver says this, he says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. And then little Susan, the, the, one of the little girls, she says, oh, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. This morning, we are going to see in our text both of those things that this character in, in C.S. Lewis's work, The Chronicles of Narnia, uh, talks about, that God isn't safe, but that he's good. Our text is 2 Samuel chapter 5 and chapter 6. My purpose this morning is to help us to see God as he is presented in the scripture, that he is both transcendent, meaning that he's holy, that he's great and good, and that God is also imminent, that God is delightful. Both things are true when we speak about God. God is simultaneously dangerous and delightful. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will see what, what the word has for us this morning. Let's pray. Father, this morning we come to you as your people. We are hungry for your word. We thank you that we can come into this place with other believers and to, to sing to you, to express our heart's joy to you, our heart's affections. God, I pray this morning that you will speak through your word, that you'll help us all to see you as you are. God, don't let the messenger get in the way of the message. Make your word clear. Change us this morning. These things we ask in Christ's name, amen. The first thing that we're gonna see is uh, that God is dangerous. And we're getting this from 2 Samuel chapter five. So turn with me in your scriptures to 2 Samuel chapter five. Now as we saw so far in our, in our series of covering David's life, we saw last week that David has been crowned king. The fighting between David's men and the remnant of Saul's men has come to a, a bloody conclusion. The, the, the civil war in Israel is over. David has been crowned king. 
In 2 Samuel chapter 5, David secures a capital city, and that is the city of David or Jerusalem. A united Israel with a quality, godly king like David as opposed to Saul now poses a major threat to the Philistines. Word has gotten back to them. They, they now need to intervene. No longer is Israel a fractured nation. They're a united nation with a united king. So we pick up in our story in verse 17. Remember the context. Jerusalem is secure. David is king. Israel is united. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel... All the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it, and he went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to bel Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Therefore, the name of that place is Bel Perazim. And the Philistines left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. So here's the situation. You have a united Israel. You have a a king. You have a city. The Philistines come. They're, they're, They're going to intervene. David does not go out to meet them. David does not go to, to fight them. He, he is not like Saul in this sense. He, at, at this point, he's not gonna arrogantly presume that the strength to defeat this enemy of God is within himself. He goes to God. And, and, and notice what it says. He, he asks God, if I go against them, will you give them into my hands? And God says, yes, I will go. I will Go ahead, I will give them into your hands. So we see here that God is dangerous. He is dangerous. He, the, the, the wording there is he breaks out against the Philistines. He, he, he comes on them like a breaking flood. As you read this battle account, all of the glory, all of the power, all of the, all of the, 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 the credit for victory goes to God. He is like this roaring tsunami that just overflows and drowns out this enemy army. The Philistines' defeat is swift and it is total, so much so that in their fleeing, they leave their gods. This is a total humiliating defeat for the Philistines. Verse 22, and the Philistines came up yet again and they spread out in the valley of Rephaim And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, you shall not go up. Go around to their rear and come against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourselves, for then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him and struck down the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. Here again, We see in this second battle, once again, God is getting all of the glory. God, not David, is the dangerous one. David, again, he goes to God. He asks God, what shall I do? God, like, literally gives him the campaign strategy. Don't meet them face on. Go around them. And then when you hear the trees, then when you hear that, boom, go in there and flank them. I will give them to to you. What's fascinating about this is that there is, there is no long, drawn-out campaign described here. It's just a couple of verses. There, there aren't many details given. In this story, the Philistines are defeated, and they are defeated e- easily because God is dangerous, and he broke out against the Philistines. Israel now has been united. The rightful king is on the throne. Jerusalem, the capital, the social and political center of Israel is in place. Now, the only thing that remains is to bring back the symbol of God's presence. It's time to return God's throne 
to the capital city of his people. So we pick up in, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. This is what the text says. David again gathered all of the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all of the people who were with him to Bel Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. So here now, David, now that, the, now that the, the Jerusalem is taken, now that they have a capital city, David purposes that it's time to bring back the ark and to put it, the ark of the covenant, in the center of Israel, in the, in the center of God's people. Why is this? What, what is the significance of the ark of the covenant? Well, we see first off, very obviously, that the ark signifies God's Kingship. Notice at the end of verse two there, it says, it says, bring up the ark of God, which is called by the name of Yahweh, Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. The first thing that we need to know about the ark's significance is that the ark signifies God's kingship. This golden box is God's very own throne. The ark of the covenant signifies God's presence. In Numbers 10, 35 through 36, we have this. Listen to the account. It says, And whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, to the ten thousand thousands of Israel. Do you, do you see what's going on there? The ark goes out, and it is so wed to God's presence that Moses actually, when addressing the ark, he says, go this way, Lord. It's, 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 equa- it's equated to God because it signifies his very own presence. So the ark signifies God's kingship. This is his throne. The ark signifies God's presence. The ark also signifies God's revelation. In Exodus 25, 21 through 22, the Bible says this, And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There, at the ark, on the mercy seat, I will meet you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. The ark of the covenant was the very meeting place where God would speak to his people. And within the ark, God's written law, his written revelation was placed within. Finally, the ark signified atonement. Leviticus 16, 14 through 15. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat shall he sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. So we see that the ark is not just some relic. It's not just some golden box. The ark signified God's kingship. It's it's his throne. The ark signified God's presence. This is where he spoke from. The ark signified God's revelation. His written law was within it. And the ark signified atonement. Blood would be sprinkled upon it. It is, the ark is central to, God, to, to Israel's existence because God is central to Israel's existence. It will not do for David and for the newfound unified kingdom. It will not do for them to keep the ark on the outskirts of the kingdom of Israel. It has to be placed in the center. So our story picks up in verse three of chapter six. They carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ohio went before the cart, or before the ark, So we have here the transportation. We have here detail given about how these people are moving the ark. 
Now, at first glance, this may not seem like this is relevant information, but what's going on here in our story is we have an element of foreshadowing. Are you familiar with what foreshadowing is? Like, like, like for instance, if you're watching a movie, let's say you're watching a, 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 a cop drama, and uh, you know, our, our hero, he's home for the night. You know, usually he, cops in, in movies and TV shows, the ones that we like, they're always depressed for some reason. So you know, our hero cop, he comes home, he pours whiskey, I don't know why they're always drinking whiskey, some sort of liquor into his cup, he takes a swig, and then he, he gets called out, right? And it's like raining outside. It's gloomy and it's always nighttime. And, and there's just this ominousness about it, like, like something's not right. And then so he's in a hurry, maybe he's gotta go out, rescue somebody, whatever the situation. He walks out the door, you know, lightning flickers, rain's coming down. And, and the camera, what is, it, what is it focusing on? It's like focusing on the pistol he left on the table and he walks out, right? Why is that? that that's foreshadowing. That as an audience, that's telling us that it's dark, it's gloomy, something's about to go down because it's nighttime and it's raining. Oh, and our hero, he just forgot his weapon. And that's why the camera's focusing in on it. So that, just to give us a little clue, a little hint, something's gonna go down and our hero is gonna be in danger. That is what's going on in these verses. This is not unnecessary information that the Ark of the Covenant is being carried on a cart. This is foreshadowing. There's something ominous that is going to happen. Look in verse three. It says a new cart. And then right after that, it, like, it repeats itself for emphasis again, a new cart. Something is going to happen and it's going to involve this new cart. Verse five. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. So, so you have this great procession. You have this great parade. Remember at the beginning, David, David has accumulated 30,000 men and they're going in this parade, and they have their, their instruments, they're loud. This, this, God's people here are worshiping, and they're worshiping with, with great fanfare and great enthusiasm. This is a joyous day, a moment of celebration. Why? Because God's ark, his presence is going to be carried back to where it belongs, right in the heart of God's people. Things could not be better for David and for Israel. But this day is not going to stay as a celebration. This day is going to take a very dark turn. Tragedy strikes in verse 6. Let's read the account. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. Does that strike you sideways as you read that account? Here you have this celebration this great parade, thousands upon thousands of people are there with their instruments, everybody's worshiping, it's a great day of celebration. They're coming along, the ark stumbles, the ark is fixing to fall off this cart. Here's this guy Uzzah who's been entrusted like, to take care of the ark, like, like his job is to make sure the ark gets from point A to point B. They hit something, the oxen stumble, the ark fall, starts to fall off the cart, Uzzah reaches out to steady it to make sure, to ensure that this precious symbol doesn't hit the ground. And what happens? Does God commend Uzzah? Does God say, well done? No. The anger of the Lord is kindled against Uzzah and Uzzah is immediately struck dead. This is offensive. And I have to be honest with you, when I first learned that this was the text that I was going to preach for this Sunday, I wasn't really that enthused about it because this chapter has always really bothered me. It's bothered me because I'm like, what is the deal? Like, like Uzzah did a good thing and he's dead for it. 
And then the other part, the other reason why it bothered me is because you know, I grew up Baptist and later on in the chapter we're gonna have David dancing and rolling around like a crazy man. And so, so I just, I was not really like looking forward to this. So, so you, can, you can understand where I'm coming from. So we have Uzzah. He, he struck down, why? Why is Uzzah struck down for doing something with the right intention? You see that going on here? He has the right motivation. He, he has the right intention. He wants to keep this thing from hitting the ground. And yet, he's struck dead. Why is this? Well, the reason why this was is because as a son of Koath, Uzzah was not permitted to touch the ark. He could transport it, but he was not allowed to touch it. In Numbers 4.15, we have this regulation. When Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, as the camp sets out, after that the sons of Kohath shall come to carry these, but they must not touch the holy things lest they die. So the, the, the proper way to transport the Ark of the Covenant is for it to be covered, for them to put poles through the rings on the side, and for them to carry it. But that's not what David does. That's not what Uzzah does. What they do instead is they don't cover it and carry it with poles. What they do is they just put it on a cart, a new cart. Now, you may look at that and you may say, well, it's a new cart. This, that they're, they're at least trying to be careful. They're at least trying to show reverence. They're at least trying to show respect. And all of that is true. But the point remains that they did it wrongly. They had all of the right motivations. They had all the enthusiasm in the world. They were worshiping God. And still, Uzzah is struck down dead. And he struck down dead because the way in which they carried God's ark was one of disobedience. The transportation of the ark done here was the same as the pagan Philistines. Do you remember in 1 Samuel, the Philistines, they've taken the ark? Do you remember this? They've, they've captured it as like a prize of war. And as a result, they suffer. They suffer physically because of it, and, and, and they want to get rid of it. So what do the Philistines do? They, they recognize that this is not just a, a, a wooden box covered in gold with some angels on it. They recognize there, there's something to this object. So they, the Philistines, the pagan Philistines, they build a new ark out of reverence, out of respect, out of fear. And they put the ark on this new cart and they send it on its way. Uzzah and the Israelites should have known better. Why? Because they were not the Philistines. They were, they were not some pagans that didn't know better. They were God's own chosen people who had been given special revelation. They had been given the law. They had been told by God, this is how I want you to carry the ark. And instead of obeying God's way, they mimicked the pagan nations around them in their treatment of God, and this was not acceptable. God's people in this episode did not revere God. They did not see God for how dangerous he is. They did not respect his holiness. This same incident is a constant temptation for God's people. Left to our own, apart from God's revealed word, we would come up with our own sense of justice, with our own sense of what is right, and with our own sense of what is wrong. If we are not getting our revelation, our ideas about God from the Bible, we will get our ideas about God from our culture and from our world. And we, like Uzzah and these, these Israelites, like them, our perspective of God will become a worldly wrong perspective of God. God, the Bible tells us, is holy. He, he is transcendent. That, that means he's, he's above us. He's, he's entirely different from us. We were made of dirt, and God is this infinite being who speaks the universe into existence. We like, cannot get any farther away from what God is in his majesty. He is great, he is transcendent, he is distinct, he is 
perfect. Listen to how Isaiah describes his encounter with God. He says in Isaiah 6, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, and two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the Lord, the King the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah, he's, he's transported there and he catches this glimpse of God's holiness and immediately he is undone. God is holy and God's holiness is dangerous. In Exodus 33, 18 through 20, we have this account. Moses says to God, please show me your glory. And God responds, he says, I will make all my goodness pass for you, before you and will proclaim you before my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. God's holiness is dangerous. David and the Israelites had disregarded God's holiness and now Uzzah was dead. The joyous parade was over. How did David and the people react to this very sobering moment? We see his reaction in verse 8. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. So first, David is angry. He calls the place Perez Uzzah, which means breaking out against Uzzah. This is the second time that this kind of language has been used in our text. Do you remember that that, that language of breaking out was used against who earlier? It was used against God's enemies, the Philistines. And here, God is not, is not breaking out against the enemies of his people. We would expect that. We would think, yeah, yeah, it's, it's not surprising. It's right for God to break out like a flood against his enemies. But what's shocking and what's surprising in this account is that not only does God break out against his enemies, but when God's people disregard God's mandate and when they disregard his holiness, God breaks out against his own people. So David is angry. He's angry because humanity, when confronted with God's holiness, recoils in anger and disgust. In our perverted sense of justice, we demand that God conform to us, not that we conform to him. You want to try this out? Talk to any one of your unsaved friends or family members and tell them that for one sinful offense, they will spend eternity in hell unless they repent. How do they respond to that? With anger and with disgust. Why? Because unsaved humanity and human, anyone left to their own, they develop their own sense of justice, our own sense of right and wrong. And when we're confronted with God's holiness, it's inherently offensive because we think we're the center of the universe. And when God breaks into our life and he reminds us that he is the sovereign one, we recoil. So David is angry. And then look in verse nine. David is also afraid. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take of the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David only took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. So not only is David angry, but he's afraid. And David here with his question, he identifies man's greatest problem. So, so remember the situation, Uzzah's now dead. David's angry. 
David's afraid. And he asked, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? This is man's greatest problem. David asked the question that every single human asks himself. How can I stand before holy God? How can I experience God's presence? David here identifies man's greatest problem, namely that God is holy and man is not. Man is a sinner. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We see that the Bible teaches that God's justice demands that he punish sin. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Because God is holy and God is just and God is righteous, he must punish sin. And that is precisely why the gospel is such good news. The gospel is good news because Jesus died in our place and bore God's wrath. Isaiah 53, 4 through 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities upon him, which the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. 2 Corinthians 5.21, which is one of the most beautiful verses in all of Scripture. Listen to what it says. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that way in him we might become the righteousness of God. The great exchange that takes place for God's people is this. We deserve God's wrath. We deserve it. It's right. It's just. It's what a holy God should do. And the beauty of the gospel for God's people is this, that on the cross, our sins are placed upon Christ and Christ is is, is God's wrath beats down upon Christ. God breaks out against his very own son. And the beauty of the gospel is that now Christ's righteous robes are placed upon us. We ourselves don't become righteous. We are just robed in Christ's righteousness. The gospel is good news because it is the truth that though we are guilty and deserving of hell, God intervenes for us and saves us. Remember that when Jesus died on the cross and when he bore God's wrath, remember what happens in the narrative in the gospels? The the curtain temple is torn in two. Why? Because now, because of the atonement, God's people have access, direct access, to God's presence. They don't have to go through a priest. The gospel is not just good news for the unconverted. The gospel is good news for a believer as well. If, if you've repented of your sin and you've asked Christ to save you, the gospel is not just the, like, like the entrance into the Christian life. Like the gospel is the foundation that you stand on. It, it affects the everyday. Why? Because when we sin, and we will continue to sin, we still feel guilt. We still have to repent. And sometimes, like we, 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 when we are sinning, and when we, are, when we are not walking with God, our emotions can take over. And we can feel very far from God's presence even though we know that he's forgiven us. So what the gospel does is it reminds us that feelings aside, we are right before God. Psalm 103.10, he does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. In Colossians 2.14, Paul says, he canceled aside the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands this he set, set aside, nailing it to the cross. As Christians, we can, this can be true of us, Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter into the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We now, because of the gospel, we can go into God's very own presence. So we see that God is dangerous. Secondly, we see that God is delightful. Second Samuel 6, 11. 
And the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So we have here, you know, David doesn't bring the ark into Jerusalem because he's scared, so they, they set it aside. They, they put it in this guy's house, Obed-Edom, and God blesses Obed-Edom. And what this tells us is that God's intention is not to bring heartache on his people. God doesn't strike down people because he gets a kick out of it. God doesn't strike down people because it's fun to strike down people. He, he blesses open Edom. Now let's look at verse 12. And it was told to King David, the Lord blessed the household of open Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the, host, the, the house of open Edom to the city of David with, with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. Earlier, David asked how the ark of God could come to him. We saw that the answer to David's question is the gospel. And here we get a glimpse of that. David in this procession, he's not, they're not starting with rejoicing, right? They're, 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 not, they're not presuming upon God. This time, things have changed. We, we find out later uh, in 1 Chronicles 15 that instead of them putting the ark on a, on a cart and sending it on their way, they, they learn from their lesson. Instead, they carry it. They do it God's way. Before, they had this joyful celebration and Uzzah died. It began with celebration and ended with death. Well, well now they learned. Now, they start with death, they start with sacrifice, then they begin the procession, then they celebrate. David dances before the Lord as an act of worship. Why? Because he's overtaken with joy. David delights in God. God is his highest joy. God is his supreme treasure. We see this reality all throughout the Psalms, many of which were written by David. Consider Psalm 4-7. Speaking of God, he says this, you have put more joy in my heart than they when their grain and their wine abound. David's joy was not circumstantial. His satisfaction was in Christ. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life in your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What this tells us is that true joy, true fulfillment, and true satisfaction in our life can only be found in Christ. Listen to Isaiah 55, one through three. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligent to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me and hear that your soul may live. God invites his people to come and to feast and to feast in him because only God satisfies and he asks us he doesn't say it's wrong to pursue your own joy what he does is he asks why are you pursuing your joy in things that are fleeting why are you putting your satisfaction in things that won't satisfy satisfy you come to me he says come to me and be satisfied the great Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs he says this and we'll put it on the screen he says this a soul that is capable of God can be filled with nothing else but God. Nothing but God can fill a soul capable of God. Though a gracious heart knows that it is capable of God and was made for God, carnal hearts think without reference to God. But a gracious heart being in lar- or gracious heart uh, being enlarged to be capable of God, enjoying someone of him, can be filled by nothing in the world. It must only be God himself. Therefore, you will observe, and whatever God may give to a gracious heart, a heart that is godly, unless he gives himself, it will not do. A godly heart will not only have the mercy, but the God of that mercy as well. 
So not only does the Bible command us to prize Christ as supremely delightful, it teaches us that not delighting in God is sinful. Listen to Jeremiah 2, 12 through 13. Be appalled, O heavens. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. What are those two evils? Number one, they've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And number two, they hewed out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. C.S. Lewis so eloquently expresses this. He says this, if there lurks in most modern minds the notion that to desire our good and earnestly to hope for the enjoyment of it is a bad thing, I submit that this notion has come from Immanuel Kant and the Stoics and is no part of the Christian faith. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum, because they cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are too easily pleased. So Christian, are you delighting in God? Is he your supreme treasure, joy, and satisfaction? Going back to the parade in 2 Samuel, we have the parade going on in verse 16. While David is dancing, not like a Baptist, before the Lord and whirling about, the, the, the story changes to, to, to his wife, Michael. Verse 16, as the ark of the Lord came into the city, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Again, like the ark on the, like the, ark on the cart, this is foreshadowing. Like, like the, the story is now changing. Something is gonna go down between David and Michael, just like something went down between Uzzah and the ark. We notice now that the narrative goes back in verse 17, and we see that David, he offers peace offerings, burnt offerings, and then David, he distributes food among the people, and they eat. The ark comes into the city, burnt offerings are made, David blesses the people, they eat a meal. Eating a meal communicates reconciliation. Eating a meal communicates friendship. Eating a meal communicates communion. That's in part one of the reasons why the symbolism in, com in the communion meal is so, so rich. Like we have a relationship with God, we share this meal as the body of Christ. This has been an amazing, joyful day. And now David will return home. In verse 20, it says this, David returned home to bless his household, but Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. It's been a great day. David is happy. He's going to go home. He's going to bless his wife, and here she comes, he did, David, David doesn't even make it in the front door. She comes out to meet him, and with sarcasm, she says, how the king of Israel displayed himself today. May, Michael is offended by David's whirling about, looking like a fool before the Lord. Why? Because David is a king, and she is a queen. Her, her, her snobbery is seen in the way that she addresses the women that were present with David. She says like, like they were your slaves, slaves, right? Like, like this is not just a slave, that's bad enough. But we see that David is, 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 is delighting in God in dance before a slave's slave. And for a snob like Michael, this is not acceptable. For someone who is, who is bound up by their pride, this is not acceptable acceptable. Michael, remember, had fallen in love with a warrior. She had fallen in love with the king. Remember in, in 1 Samuel 18, 20, it said, now Saul's daughter loved David. And then after that, David goes and kills 200 Philistines for her. Like, this is better than a dozen roses. He brings, well, well, you know, David brings, uh, you know, these, uh, 
Well, you know what? It is what it is. David brings these foreskins that he had cut off from these dead people and he presents it and, and, and foreskins in this situation, I guess, are better than roses. The point is this, that Michael wanted a king. She wanted a warrior. She fell in love with a strong man like Josh Valdez. And now, instead of this strong, kingly warrior that she fell in love with, she sees David prancing about delighting before God. And David rebukes her in verse 21. He says, it was the Lord, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above his house to appoint me as prince over the Israel and I will celebrate before the Lord and I will make myself more contemptible than this and I will be abased in your eyes. Michael treats David with sarcasm and David responds just as sharply. He reminds her that God had chosen him above her, above her father, and above Israel. And David's singular resolve is to delight in God and to be made a fool in the world's eyes for God's sake. In other words, David was primarily concerned not what Michael thought of him, not what the slaves slaves thought of him. David's primary concern was what does God think of me and I'm gonna so value him, so delight in him, so treasure him that I will dance before him. The gospel frees us from the tyranny of the, fr- of the fear of men. In conclusion, three takeaways from this text. Number one, as Christians, we must embrace what the Bible teaches us about God's character. He is great, he is holy, he is dangerous, but he's also good, loving, and delightful. The biblical picture, portrait of God is both, not either or. Secondly, we must revere God. We must esteem him as, tho- as holy. We must respect him and honor him. Third and finally, we must delight in God. We must see God as our highest joy and our most fulfilling satisfaction. We were made to love him, enjoy him, and delight in him. And may that be what our hearts are towards God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and I ask for your people this morning that you'll help all of us to delight in you, to love you, to respect you, to revere you, but also, God, to have our satisfaction and our joy in you. Thank you for your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.